It might surprise some of you to discover this, but I am actually forever being inundated with requests to make videos about Hull City. No, seriously. I suspect that there are a couple of reasons why that is the case, despite Hull City not being the most glamorous, nor the biggest of football clubs. Firstly, for those of you who don't know, I am a Hull City fan, and I think that people enjoy hearing an authentic voice talk about a subject for want of a better term. And secondly, just because Hull City is an incredibly chaotic football club. It's never dull in Hull, or so the saying goes, and that has tended to be true, in my lifetime at least, of the city's only professional football club. Between 2003-04 and 2007-08, the Tigers won three promotions in five seasons, in one of the fastest ascents from English football's basement division to the top flight of all time, despite never having previously played top flight football in more than 100 years of existence. In six out of the club's last 10 seasons, Hull City have either won promotion or been relegated. In 2010, a financial cataclysm following overspending and relegation from the Premier League cast a dark shadow over the club's future. But at that point, the Alam family stepped in as saviours. Promotion, a first ever FA Cup final, and even a first taste of European football soon followed, but the relationship between the Alams and Hull City supporters very quickly soured. Though their legendary status at the club ought to have been set in stone, an attempted name change from 2013 through to 2015, after Hull City Council rejected the owner's attempts to buy what was then named the KC Stadium, fractured a fanbase at a time when the club's sporting achievements had never been greater. The application to change the club's name to Hull Tigers was rejected by the FA Council in April 2014, but despite Chairman Assem Alam's promise to sell the club within 24 hours if the application were to be rejected, it wasn't until the start of this year, almost eight years on, that Hull City was actually sold. I have made two videos about the Alam family's ownership of Hull City, one in March 2020 and one in November 2021, which I will leave links to in the video description should any of you wish for greater context as to the situation at the club prior to the current owner's arrival. Ever since Turkish media magnate Ajahn Ilajala completed his takeover of the club though, I have been asked to make a part three to the what on earth is going on at Hull City series, but I wanted to hold off until there was some real meat on the bone. However, just days before Hull City kick off their championship campaign, at home to Bristol City, and with the club just having had arguably the strangest transfer window in the history of the championship, now seemed like the perfect time to give in to the demands for a Hull City update. So sit back, relax, and join me on a trip to Istanbul, where a revolution has taken place over six short months, and whether it will be Turkish delight or despair at the MKM Stadium, it seems unlikely that things will be boring for Hull City this season. By the end of the Alam's reign at Hull City, the anger and division that had previously plagued the club had largely subsided and given way to apathy and dismay. The second half of the 2019-20 season, following the sale of Kamil Grosicki and Jared Bowen, saw the Tigers win just one of their last 20 games, going from playoff contenders in January to finishing dead last, and infamously, losing one game during that run, 8-0 to Wigan Athletic. Even a League One title the following season, the Tigers' first league title since the 1960s, did little to bring the feel-good factor back to the MKM Stadium especially since that entire season was played behind closed doors. Hull City's average attendance last season, despite a boost following the takeover, was just 12,888, only the 17th highest in the championship, and although there are those who just seem to think that that is the norm for the club, before the Alam's name change fiasco, the removal of concessions, and a whole raft of other PR disasters, that wasn't actually the case. Back in the 2003-04 season, which was Hull City's first full season at what was then named the KC Stadium, the club averaged 16,846 fans at their home games in the old third division, or League Two as it is now known. 
There were no League Two teams, with an average attendance that high last season, nor was there, in 2003-04. It is for that reason, though, it is all too easy to forget now that the national press frequently used to refer to Hull City as sleeping giants, and those impressive crowds continued throughout the next decade. Only Sheffield Wednesday bettered Hull City's average of 18,027 fans, on average, in League One in 2004-05, and when the Tigers competed in the Premier League for the first time in the 2007-08 season, they had the fewest number of empty seats, on average, of any team in the league over the course of the campaign. It is almost impressive, therefore, how quickly the Alams were able to decimate that support through a combination of boycotts and disillusionment. Perhaps foremost, then, in Ajahn Illajala and his team's remit, as incoming owners, was the task of getting fans back on side. In that respect, the media-savvy Illajala has done a lot of things right. Some of them, like allowing the local radio station to cover games again, and not frequently, you know, insulting supporters, were admittedly fairly straightforward. But others, like a new membership scheme and a transparency around transfer dealings, deserve real credit. With membership schemes that start from just £25 a month for adults, and free for under 10s, and matchday tickets that start from as little as £20 for adults, and £3 for under 10s, including for all away supporters, Hull City have some of the most competitively priced season and matchday tickets, not just in the Championship, but in the entire EFL. The impact of that, along with the improved communication and ambition that the club has shown, has already paid dividends. It was reported this week that more than 12,500 memberships have already been sold before the season has begun, a significant milestone given that last season's average attendance was, as I said, just 12,888. Of course, whilst rhetoric, presentation and not burning more bridges than German soldiers whilst retreating from Lapland in 1945 all help, everyone wants to see a winning team, and there are a few better ways to get either new fans through the turnstiles or old fans back on side than through success. In pursuit of that, Hull City have signed seven first-team players so far this summer, eight if you include loanees, with one more having been signed off on but not yet publicly announced, and a further one or two expected to come through the door before the transfer window slams shut. It's always slamming shut, isn't it, the transfer window? It's never sort of gently closed. <clears throat> anyway. Despite being the second tier of English football, the Championship is among the most cosmopolitan leagues in the entire world. The combination of relegated Premier League teams with parachute payments, ever-ambitious chairmen and players both gambling upon promotion to the promised land of the Premier League, and lots of foreign owners, has resulted in a markedly diverse pool of players. Even still, Hull City's transfer business has been notably international. Not one of their fresh first-team recruits at the time of this recording are British or Irish, non-speak English as their first language, and only two have been signed from other English clubs. Among them, however, has been the Tigers' most eye-catching signing of all, namely that of Jean-Michael Serry, who arrived from Fulham without a transfer fee after his contract expired in West London. Barcelona twice tried to sign Serry for €40 million Euros during his time at Nice, before the midfielder ended up at Fulham for what was briefly a club record £25 million during a summer of heavy spending at Craven Cottage. Serry's first season in England was a disappointment, though he certainly wasn't alone as Fulham were relegated, and he spent the 2019-20 season on loan at Galatasaray, followed by half of the 2021 season on loan at Bordeaux. Serry returned to London last summer and enjoyed an impressive campaign under former Hull City boss Marco Silva as Fulham comfortably won the championship title. There was disappointment among some Fulham fans in light of his performances last season when it was announced that the club would neither be triggering the one-year extension in Serry's contract that they had an option upon, nor offering him a new deal. Serry was one of the highest paid players at Fulham, and therefore one of the highest paid players in the championship last season, with a reported £65,000 weekly wage. 
which is likely, to be around 10 times that of what any Hull City player was paid prior to Illa Jalla's arrival. Given his salary and performances last season at Fulham, Seri always seemed like the Tigers' most ambitious transfer target, and it looked as though the deal had fallen through at one stage, with the reports that he had decided to join a Serie side instead. Seri eventually U-turned upon his U-turn and signed on the dotted line, though, agreeing to a three-year deal, and there is no doubt that he is a marquee signing for a club that finished 19th in the championship last season. The other arrival with championship pedigree and experience is former Portuguese U-team international Tobias Figueiredo, who also won promotion to the Premier League last season. Figueiredo had spent the last four and a half years at Nottingham Forest, where he played more than 120 games, endearing himself to Forest fans through his unquestionable commitment to the cause. Figueiredo is not by any means a Rolls-Royce of a centre-back. He is more of a kick-it-and-head-it style stopper, who relishes last-ditch tackles and balls floated into the box, but is unlikely to make too many assists this season. He is a solid signing for a team that, on all current evidence, looks likely to play with three centre-backs, at least as their plan A this season. As for those brought in from a little further afield, Elias Said Manesh has joined the club on a permanent basis for between two to four million pounds, having spent the second half of last season on loan at the MKM Stadium. Although the Iranian international could only actually manage to score one goal in 12 games in East Yorkshire last season, his confidence and performance levels grew dramatically even during his short spell on loan, and his tenacity and work rate made him a bit of a favourite with fans. Jurgen Klopp once said that no playmaker in the world is as good as a counter-pressing situation. And if Saeed Manesh can add goals to his already impressive pressing, industry, and defending from the front, he could become a real menace for championship defenders. That is, of course, a very big if. In terms of actual playmakers, it looks as though Ozan Tufan is the man who Hull City will turn to as their primary creator, brought in, like Saeed Manesh, from Fenerbahce, reportedly for around £4 million. Pounds. Off the back, of a fairly disastrous loan spell at Watford last season. Tufan is the Tigers' riskiest summer recruit to date, with considerable upside if things work out, but undoubtedly a hefty downside if they don't. Capped 65 times by Turkey at the age of 27, Tufan is clearly a player of real pedigree and talent, and you could see that in glimpses, even during his time at Watford. Talent was not his biggest struggle at Vicarage Road, but rather it was his fitness, or lack thereof, and seemingly his difficulty to get his weight under control. Tufan struggled to adapt to the pace of the Premier League, according to his Wikipedia page, which I think is the nice way of putting it, and the fact that he still looks unfit, and to be carrying too much weight now, following a full pre-season and just days before the actual season is set to start, ought to be a concern. The pace of play in the Championship is often even more intense than that of the Premier League, across a full 90 minutes at least, and the games come even thicker and even faster than they do in English football's top flight. Shota Arvaladze will hope that Tufan himself doesn't look any thicker and is rather a lot faster in just a few weeks' time than he has appeared in Hull City's pre-season friendlies. The most impressive of Hull City's seven first-team signings to date, in my opinion, is Oscar Estupinian. He was the fifth-highest scorer in the Portuguese Premier League last season, with 15 goals, which puts him 11 goals behind top scorer Darwin Nunes on 26, whilst Nunes set Liverpool back a potential club record £85 million this summer, Estupinian joined Hull City completely free of charge, after his contract with Vitoria de Guimarães expired. Given Estupinian's goals in Europe's sixth highest ranked league, the fact that he just made his debut for Colombia's national team, and his age, he is only 25, it is hard to imagine that there wasn't a handful of other clubs vying for his signature. Having watched him live for the first time just last week, I must admit, I was taken aback by his size. Wikipedia claims that Estupinian is just six foot tall, but if he is only six foot, I must be about five foot eight, because 
he looked absolutely massive to me. Not just in terms of his height, but his all-round stature and strength. I can't imagine that there are too many championship defenders who will relish going for a 50-50 with him this season. And whilst acknowledging that it might take him some time to adjust, he is one that I'm really excited to see how he gets on this season. If a bottom half Premier League team had picked him up on a free transfer this summer, I'd have thought that that looked like decent business. So for Hull City to have done it, I think is one that has maybe just gone a little bit under the radar. It is quite possible that Hull City will have the biggest strike partnership in the championship next season, at least whenever Benjamin Tete is partnering Estupinian, since even according to the Ghanaian International's Wikipedia page, he is six foot four inches tall. Using the same wiki shrinkflation as Estupinian, one can only assume that he is actually about six foot eight. Not only is Tete massive though, he's also powerful, aggressive, and just a little bit nasty. He only scored seven goals in 26 games for Yeni Malatiaspor last season, where, despite having three years left on his current deal, Hull City stated that he has been signed free of charge. Whilst Estupinian and Tete are unknown quantities by championship standards, and therefore can't be considered guaranteed goals, their physicality also makes them appear, artificially at least, to be well suited to the division. And the two of them combined, arriving in place of the departed Tom Eaves, means that out-and-out -out centre forward is one of the few positions where you could say with some degree of certainty, I think, that the Tigers have strengthened. The only other confirmed permanent signing that I haven't yet mentioned, partly because he is the player that I know the least about, is Dokan Sinek who is rumoured to have commanded a fee of £4 million in order to get him out of his hometown club of Antaliaspor. Renowned for his versatility, Sinek can play out wide on either flank, as a number 10, or even in central midfield. And having won his first three caps for Turkey in 2022, he bagged a brace against Lithuania in the Nations League in June. As I said, I honestly just don't know very much about him. And whilst that is, most emphatically the case with Cynic, it is true to a certain extent of almost all of Hull City's summer signings. And that is why they are most likely the most unpredictable team in the championship going into this upcoming season. The playoffs is the aim, according to Vice Chairman Tan Kessler, despite the Tigers finishing 24 points off the top six last season. It is worth noting, however, that in addition to a whole raft of new arrivals, there have also been some pretty significant departures from the MKM Stadium this summer. Academy graduate and England under-21 international Keen Lewis Potter, who was one of the most impressive players in the championship last season, has joined Brentford for £16 million, with the potential to rise to £20 million, subject to add-ons. Lots of Hull City fans seem to think that that is good business for the club, and I would have agreed 12 months ago but now I'm not quite so sure. Lewis Potter's progress last season was remarkable. He has played more games, scored more goals, and gained greater international recognition than Jared Bowen had when he was his age, and the 18 to 22 million pound fee that West Ham paid for Bowen now looks like an absolute bargain. Whilst Bowen was a Premier League player in waiting when he joined West Ham, having been the best player in the championship over the previous 12 months, Lewis Potter isn't quite at that same level yet. Aged only 21, but he is quicker than Bowen, and he can strike a ball as sweet as a nut. So whilst he is less of a surefire thing, I do actually think that he has a higher ceiling than Bowen. And if I was a Brentford fan, I would be pretty excited about his arrival. In addition to Lewis Potter, the Tigers have also sold George Honeyman, who was the most influential midfielder at the club last season, and the Tigers' star man, in their League One title-winning campaign just the previous season. Ozan Tufan may well be more talented than Honeyman, I haven't seen enough of him to say for certain, but it does seem unlikely that the Turkish international will be able to match him in terms of industry and ground covered, something that is vitally important in the championship. What's more, unlike Lewis Potter, Honeyman didn't depart for a considerable fee, but rather he joined championship rivals Millwall for an undisclosed, but most likely pretty negligible fee. Both Lewis Potter and Honeyman 
are said to have pushed for their transfers, rather than departing for any other reason. Lewis Potter because he wanted to play in the Premier League and was offered a life-changing contract, and Honeyman because he didn't feel that the club were determined enough to keep hold of him, or that the money that he had been offered suggested that he was a key part of their plans moving forward. Ajanila Jalla has enough credit in the bank for bringing some semblance of positivity back to East Yorkshire to mask over those departures, but only a fool would downplay the significance of a team that finished 19th last season, selling two of their three best players over the course of the previous campaign, and that is exactly what Hull City have done. Lewis Potter alone, it should be said, either scored or assisted over a third of all of the club's goals last season. I think that it would be difficult to say for certain that Hull City have a stronger squad and a stronger starting level now than they had last season. That might sound like a ludicrous statement in a few months' time. If Tufan can get fit, Sinek can fill the void vacated by Lewis Potter, and Estupinian and Tete can't stop scoring. And naturally, given my allegiances, I sincerely hope that that is the case. But I think that it is important to note that this isn't Wolves in 2017-18, when they brought in Portuguese internationals with Champions League pedigree, complemented by some solid championship recruits. Four of Hull City's seven arrivals to date have been brought in from the Turkish Super League, which ranks 20th in UEFA's league coefficients these days, sandwiched between the top flights in Croatia and Cyprus. It would be an act of extraordinary hubris, therefore, to assume that these are players who are going to waltz straight into the championship like Diogo Jota or Ruben Neves did, and look like men amongst boys. If you look at Premier League arrivals from Turkey in recent years, the results have been pretty hit and miss. Chaglar Soyuncu made the PFA Team of the Year during his enormously impressive debut campaign, meanwhile Ozan Kabak and Cengiz Under both struggled to make an impression. And Cenk Tosin was extremely underwhelming after scoring prolifically for the Shiktas and having joined Everton for a hefty fee. History tells us that championship teams who make radical alterations to their squads, sign a whole host of foreign players, and have a foreign head coach, tend to struggle. There are exceptions to that rule, but they are few and far between, especially when one discounts teams with parachute payments. History also tells us that too much owner input around issues like transfer business and squad selection can be deeply problematic. And whilst we don't know for a fact that that is even the case at Hull City, I think it is fairly evident that Ilajala, who wants to make Hull City every Turkish football fan's second team, wanted to bring in an established Turkish international like Tufan this summer, and it is equally evident, and inarguable in fact, that whether it is because of him or Tan Kesler or anyone else for that matter, Tobias Figueiredo is the only permanent Hull City signing so far this summer who hasn't previously played his club football in Turkey. It is also worth noting that Tan Kesler, Hull City's vice chairman, who appears to be running the day-to-day -day management of the club, alongside CEO Jim Rodwell, with Illajala having numerous other business commitments and often being outside of the UK, has never previously been employed in any similar role. In fact, he has never even been employed by a football club before. He worked for the Turkish Football Federation as a strategic planner for nine years, and whilst I don't doubt that there are many transferable skills there, it is a whole different kettle of fish to the job that he has now. CEO Jim Rodwell, meanwhile, does have plenty of experience in football administration, but most of it has been at clubs that were total basket cases, such as Notts County, Scunthorpe United, and Sunderland. Manager Shotter Avaladzi, who I actually think did a very respectable job in the circumstances, having replaced Grant McCann midway through the previous campaign, is also learning on the job. This is his first job in English football, after over a year out of the game entirely, and he hasn't managed anywhere other than Uzbekistan in the last five years. He has talked about how last season was a learning curve, in terms of the sheer number of games and the intensity of those games in the championship, aside from anything else. But now he also has a number of players who aren't used to those demands, and he will have to get them ready for them, and quick. At some point this season, 
Are the lads who will also welcome Adama Traore to his squad? Not that one, a different one. Who was one of Hull City's primary transfer targets, but suffered a training ground injury, expected to rule him out until around Christmas, before his arrival, had even been officially announced. Traore won the Golden Ball at the 2015 FIFA Under-20 World Cup, an award which has previously been won by the likes of Sergio Aguero, Lionel Messi, and Diego Maradona, and his legs and talent will be a welcome addition in midfield, especially following Honeyman's departure. It seems likely, though I could well be proven wrong, it has happened a few times in the past, that Hull City will begin the season with a 5-3-2 or 3-5-2 formation, with both of those being kind of accurate descriptions, depending on whether the team is in or out of possession. On an individual basis, it seems to be the formation that gets the most number of the team's best players all on the pitch at once, since Arvaladze is blessed with a few very capable championship centre-backs, two top-class championship midfielders in Regan Slater and Jean-Michael Serry, and though unproven as yet, potentially three really dangerous forwards in Estupinian, Said Manesh, and Tete. The issue there is that Slater and Seri both like to sit fairly deep in midfield, meaning that there is a big gap between the midfield and attack, which can leave the front two, whoever they are, looking pretty isolated. Ozan Tufan is the bridge between that gap, which makes him possibly the most important player in the team, but as I mentioned earlier on, fitness, for now at least, would seem to be an issue, and Hull City really cannot afford for anyone in that midfield not to be at the races. It also means that all of the width needs to come from the wingbacks, and on that front, given the three solid championship centre-backs in the team, along with two midfielders who like to sit deep, I think Arvaladze can afford to be a bit more adventurous. In truth, I am slightly surprised that there hasn't been any transfer activity, or even transfer talk, in terms of fullbacks or wingbacks. As, whilst Hull City don't lack in numbers there, you could well argue that there is a lack of talent, if the ultimate aim is the playoffs. Louis Coyle and Callum Elder seem to be the most likely candidates to start in the opening game, but neither are particularly dangerous or creative going forward. My preference on the right would actually be either Randall Williams or Ryan Longman, who are conventionally more like wingers, if either of them can hit form, but I won't get too tied up in the weeds of my own personal preferences regarding team selection. Whilst next season will likely be a leap into the great unknown for Hull City fans, and indeed, to a certain extent, Hull City players, it is certainly preferable to what preceded it, which was a football club that felt lifeless and had no ambition. Speaking as a fan, whilst I have my reservations about the current ownership, which I think is fairly normal for a club that has had a litany of terrible owners that is longer than my arm, it is just nice to get excited again, and to see more than half of the seats at the MKM Stadium actually occupied. There is a danger of that feel-good factor being somewhat extinguished by a very difficult fixture list at the start of the season, with Burnley, Norwich, Sheffield United and West Brom among our first eight opponents. Tough fixtures that will come thick and fast at a time when a virtually brand new team is still attempting to gel. Anyone who expects instant results, I suspect, will be disappointed. But hopefully there is some patience, understanding, and a degree of moderation in terms of expectations. I am going to end there, even though I do have loads more to say about issues such as Illajala's ties to Fenerbahce and the fact that we have signed two of their players for decent fees, which I can see why some people would find problematic, the return of Nathan Baxter on loan, which I don't think I've even mentioned, and issues of FFP and the club's rapidly increasing wage bill, whether it is sustainable or not without promotion, etc, etc. But I am well aware that this video is already quite long, and most of you aren't nearly as interested in Hull City as I am. Hopefully this video provided some decent context. For those of you who have been demanding a Hull City update though, and hopefully it was quite interesting, even for those of you who haven't. It is an experiment, an ownership regime, and a transfer window, 
that would be worthy of the Sevens treatment, I think, even if it wasn't involving the club that I just so happened to support. Thank you all very much as of watching. I hope that you enjoyed today's video. If that was the case, then feel free to hit the like button. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments and make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for HITC7s. You can also find me on Twitter or on Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so. And if you did want to watch either of those previous Hull City videos about the Alams, particularly the first one, which should be on the left of your screen now, either way, they're both there if you're interested. Cheers. Have a great day.